ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. We are so glad that you're here for tonight's production of Arsenic and Old Lace. This is the fifth season of the Wilmington Island Methodist Players, and they are wonderful. You guys are really going to enjoy tonight. I'm just so excited that you're here. I do have a few housekeeping items. Um, men's restrooms are to the... Uh, oh, sorry. Turn ah. <laughs> Remember to turn off. Well, I, I'm at a play. Well, I, oh, yeah, I should probably turn off my cell phone, shouldn't I? Yeah, because that'd be so embarrassing if I were sitting in the audience and asking the phone rang. And I'm sure it's so distracting to everybody up here. Okay. Oh, yeah, and I'll remind everybody in the audience, too. Oh, okay, hey, okay. Yeah, uh, so, folks, yeah, cell phones. If everybody can turn your cell phones off completely, or vibrate mode, or do not disturb, or um, you know, airplane mode, that works too. Uh, speaking of airplanes, so emergency exits, ladies and gentlemen, are behind you, two emergency exits. Uh, the door outside is to the right. Anyway, um, as I was saying though, also um, the men's restrooms are straight to the back. The ladies' rooms are around the corner. There's another set of restrooms a little bit further down the hall. But you guys are really going to enjoy tonight. I'm so excited you're here. Thank you so much. Oh, I almost forgot. Um, desserts by our wonderful Maddie. She told me that they are going to be out throughout the evening. So when we have intermission, you may um, see yourselves back out if you'd like some more. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Yes, indeed. My sister Martha and I have been talking all week about your sermon last Sunday. It's really wonderful, Dr. Harper. In only two short years, you've taken on the spirit of Brooklyn. It's very gratifying, Miss Brewster. You see, living next to the church all of our lives, we've seen many ministers come and go. And the spirit of Brooklyn, as we always say, is friendliness. And your sermons are not as much sermons as friendly talks. Personally, I have always enjoyed my talks with Cardinal Gibbons. Or have I met him yet? <laughs> no, dear, not yet. Are the biscuits good? Bully! You have another biscuit, Dr. Harper. Oh, no. I always eat too many of your biscuits just to taste that lovely jam. Did you haven't tried the quince. We always put a little apple in with it to take the tartness out. Oh, no, no, thank you. We'll send you over a jar. Oh, no, you keep it here. That way I can be sure of having your biscuits with it. I do hope they don't make us use that imitation flour again. I mean, with this war trouble. may not seem very charitable of me, but I've almost come to the conclusion that this Mr. Hitler isn't a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> well, if war, if Europe were on another planet, Europe, sir? Yes, Teddy. Point your gun the other way. Gun? To the west. There's your enemy. There's your danger. Japan. Well, yes. Yes, of course. Teddy. No, Aunt Abby. Not so much talk about Europe and more about the canal. Well, let's not talk about war. We have another cup of tea, dear. No, thank you, Aunt Abby. Dr. Harper. No, thank you, Miss Abby. This talk of war and violence seems far removed from these surroundings. It is peaceful here, isn't it? Yes, peaceful. The gentle virtues of another day. They're all here in this house. The gentle virtues that went out with candlelight and good manners and low taxes. <laughs> all these houses in Brooklyn, the way it was when Grandfather Brewster built and furnished it, except for the electricity, and we use it as little as possible. It was Mortimer who persuaded us to put it in. I can understand that. Your nephew Mortimer seems to live only by electric light. Oh, poor boy has to work so late. I understand he's taking Elaine to the theater with him again tonight. Teddy, your brother Mortimer will be here a little later. Delighted! We're so happy as Elaine take, uh, Mortimer takes to the theater with him. Well, it's a new experience for me, having to wait up till 3 o'clock in the morning waiting for my daughter to be brought home. Oh, Dr. Harper, I hope you don't disapprove of Mortimer. Of course, Miss Abby. And I'll say so immediately that I believe Mortimer himself to be a quite worthy gentleman. But I'll also admit that I've watched the growing intimacy between him and my daughter with some trepidation. For one reason, Miss Abby. You mean his stomach, Dr. Harper. Stomach? His dyspepsia. He's bothered with it, so poor boy. 
No, Miss Abby, I'll be frank with you. I'm speaking of your nephew's unfortunate connection to the theater. A theater? Oh, no, Dr. Harper. Mortimer writes for a New York newspaper. I know, Miss Abby, I know. But a drama critic is constantly exposed to the theater. And I don't doubt that what some of them do develop an interest in it. Oh, not Mortimer. You have no fear of that. Why, Mortimer hates the theater. Really? Oh, yes, he writes awful things about the theater. <laughs> Can't blame him, poor boy. He was so happy writing about real estate, which he really knew something about. And then they just made him take this terrible night position. Mama. But as he says, the theater can't last that much longer anyway. <laughs> In the meantime, it's a living. Yes, I think if we give the theater another year or two, perhaps. Remember, what do you suppose that is? Oh, no, thank you, Teddy. I'll go. Oh, come in, Officer Hara. Hello, Miss Brewster. How are you, Mr. Klein? Very well, Miss Brewster. What news have you brought me? Colonel, we got nothing to report. Splendid. Thank you, gentlemen. At ease. <laughs> you know Dr. Harper. Sure. Hello, Dr. Harper. We've come for the toys for the Christmas fun. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's a splendid thing you men do, fixing up the discarded toys so that the poor children can have a happier Christmas. Ah, it gives us something to do when we're sitting around the station. You get tired of playing cards, start cleaning your gun, and First thing you know, you shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> so you go upstairs and get that big box from your Aunt Martha's room. How was Mrs. O'Hara today? Oh, Mrs. O'Hara's been quite ill, Dr. Harper. The <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, she's better now. A little weak still. I'm going to get you some beef broth to take to her. Don't bother, Miss Abby. You've done so much already. Oh, we made it this morning. Sister Martha's taking some to poor Mr. Beninsky right now. I won't be a minute. Sit down and be comfortable, all of you. She shouldn't go to all that trouble. <clears throat> Listen, try to stop her or her sister from doing something nice and for nothing. They don't even care how you vote. <laughs> yeah, well, I received my call to Brooklyn and moved in next door. My wife wasn't well. And when she died, and for months before, well, if I know what pure kindness and absolute generosity are, it's because I've known the Brewster sisters. <laughs> Colonel, Colonel, you promise not to do that anymore. But I have to call a meeting of the cabinet to get the release of those supplies. We used to do that in the middle of the night. The neighbors raised cane with us. They were a little afraid of him anyway. Oh, he's quite harmless. I suppose he does think he's Teddy Roosevelt. A lot worse people he could think he was. A darn shame a nice family like this hatching such a cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Teddy's father, the old girl's brother, he was some kind of genius. And their father, Teddy's grandfather, I heard he was a little crazy too. Yeah, he was crazy like a fox. He made a million dollars. Really? Here in Brooklyn? Yeah, Pat and Madison. He was a quack of some sort. Old Sergeant Edwards remembers him. He turned the house here into some sort of clinic, tried him out on people. Yeah, and he used to make mistakes occasionally, too. Yeah, but the department never bothered him too much about it on account of he was so useful on autopsies, especially the poison cases. Well, whatever he did, he left his daughters fixed for life. Thank God for that. Not that they'll ever spend any of it on themselves. Yes, I'm well aware of their charities. You don't know the tenth of it. Well, I remember when I was with the Missing Person Bureau. There was this old man we were trying to trace we never did find. But there was this rental agency. Had this house here listed for furnished rooms. They don't rent rooms. But you can bet if anybody came in looking for a room, they left here with a good meal and a couple of dollars in their kick. It's just their way of digging up people to do some good to. Why now is it this night? Good afternoon, Miss Brewster. How do you do, Mr. O'Hara, Dr. Harper, Mr. Klein? Very well, Miss Brewster. We dropped in to get the Christmas toys. Oh, yes, Teddy's Army and Navy. They're way out. They're all packed. Yeah, the Colonel's upstairs getting them. Seems the Cabinet had to approve it. Oh, yes, of course. I do hope Mrs. O'Hara is better. Oh, she's doing fine, ma'am. 
Your sister's getting me some broth to take to her. We made it this morning. I just got back from taking some to a poor man who broke ever so many bones. Oh, you're back, Martha. Uh, How is Mr. Berninsky? Well, dear, it's pretty serious, I'm afraid. The doctor was there. He's going to amputate in the morning. Can we be present? <laughs> <laughs> no, I asked, but he said that it was against the rules of the hospital. Can't be of any service. You must spare yourself something. Here's the broth, Mr. O'Hara. Be sure it's good and hot. Yes, ma'am. Oh, these are fine. These will make a lot of kids happy. That O'Malley boy, he's crazy about soldiers. That's General Miles. I've retired him. What's this? The Oregon. Teddy, dear, put it back. But the Oregon goes to Australia. Now, Teddy. No, I've given my word to fighting Bob Evans. But, Teddy. Oh, who cares what kid gets it? Bobby Evans, Izzy Cohen. <laughs> now, anyway, we'll be running along now, ma'am. Thank you very much. Not at all. Goodbye. I must be getting home. Well, before you go, Dr. Harper. Charge! <laughs> Charge the blockhouse! The blockhouse? Oh, the stairs are always San Juan Hill. Haven't you ever tried to persuade him that he wasn't Teddy Roosevelt? Oh, no. Oh, he's so happy being Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, oh once, a long time ago, remember, Martha? We well, thought if he beat George Washington, it might be a change for him. But he stayed under his bed for days and just wouldn't be anybody. We so much rather he be Teddy Roosevelt than nobody. Well, if he's happy, and what's more important, you're happy. You'll see that he signs these. What are they? Oh, Dr. Harper's arranged for Teddy to go to Happy Dale Sanitarium and make him pass on. But why should Teddy sign any papers now? It's best that it all be settled. If the Lord should take you away suddenly, perhaps we would not be able to persuade Teddy to commit himself. Mr. Weatherspoon, and that would mean an unfortunate legal procedure. Mr. Weatherspoon understands that they're to be filed away until the time comes to use them. Mr. Witherspoon, who's he? He's the superintendent at Happydale. Uh, Dr. Harper's arranged for him to drop in tomorrow the next day to meet Teddy. Well, I'll be running along or Elaine will be over here looking for him. Well, give our love to Elaine. And Dr. Harper, please don't think harshly of Mortimer because he's a drama critic. Somebody has to do those things. Did you get that key? Isn't it rather late? Yes, and dinner's going to be late, too. So why? Oh, Teddy, good news for you. You're going to Panama and dig another lock for the canal. Delighted! That's bully! Just bully! I shall prepare at once for the journey. Charge! Oh, Abby, well, I was out. Yes, dear, I just couldn't wait for you. I didn't know when you'd be back and Dr. Harper was coming. But all by yourself? Oh, I got along fine. Oh, I'll just run downstairs and see. Oh, oh, no. No, there wasn't time. And I was all alone. Well? Martha, just look in the window seat. Oh, 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 oh. oh it's Elaine. Come in, dear. Good afternoon, Miss Abby. Good afternoon, Miss Martha. Oh. I thought Father was here. Oh no, you just met, like he just this minute left. Didn't you meet him? No, I took the shortcut through the cemetery. Mortimer hasn't come yet? No, dear. No? He asked me to meet him here. Do you mind if I wait? Not at all. Why don't you sit down, dear? But we're going to speak to Mortimer about doing this to you. Doing what? Well, he was brought up to know better when a gentleman is taking a young lady out, he should call for her to her house. Oh. There's something about calling for a girl at a parsonage that discourages any man who doesn't embroider. <laughs> he does this too often. We're going to speak to him. Oh, please don't. After young men whose idea of nightlife was to take me to prayer meeting, it's wonderful to go to the theater almost every night of my life. Oh, it's very comforting for us, too, because 
if Mortimer has to see the kind of place he has to see, at least he's sitting next to the minister's daughter. <laughs> oh, my goodness, Elaine. What must you think of us not having tea cleared away by this time? Now, don't bother with anything in the kitchen until Mortimer gets here, and I'll help you. Mortimer should be here any minute. Yes. Father must have been surprised not to find me at home. I better run over and say goodnight to him. It's a shame you missed him, dear. If Mortimer comes, you tell him I'll be right back. Oh, hello, Mort. Hello, Elaine. Oh, hello, Elaine, Martha. Oh, Mortimer. Abby, Mortimer's here. Were you going somewhere? I was just going over to tell Father not to wait up for me. I didn't know that was still being done, even in Brooklyn. Hello, Mortimer. Well, hello, Aunt Abby. How are you, dear? Uh, Fine. You look well. You haven't changed much since yesterday. Oh, it was yesterday, wasn't it? Well, we've seen a great deal of you lately. Well, come sit down. Sit down. Abby, haven't we something to do in the kitchen? Huh? You know, the tea things. Oh, yes, yes, the tea things. Well, you two just make yourself at home. Just make yourself at home. Well, can't you take a hint? <clears throat> no. That was a little obvious. A lack of inventiveness, I should say. Yes, that's exactly what you'd say. <laughs> Where would you like to go for dinner? <clears throat> oh, I don't care. I'm not very hungry. Well, I just had breakfast. Suppose we wait until after the show. That'd make it pretty late, won't it? Not a little stinker will be seen tonight. What I've heard about it will be in Blake's by 10 o'clock. You ought to be fair to these plays. <clears throat> Are these plays fair to me? I've never seen you walk out on a musical. <clears throat> that musical is an opening tonight. <clears throat> No, darling, you have to learn the rules. With the musical, there's always four changes of the title and three postponements. They liked it in New Haven, but it still needs a lot of work. Oh, I was hoping it was a musical. You have such a light mind. Not a bit. Musicals somehow have a humanizing effect on you. After a serious play, we joined the proletariat on the subway and I listened to a lecture about the drama. After a musical, you take me home in a taxi and you make a few passes. Now, wait a minute, darling. That's a very inaccurate piece of reporting. Oh, I will admit that after the Berman play, you told me I had authentic beauty, and that's a heck of a thing to say to a girl. It wasn't until after our first musical you told me I had nice legs. And I have, too. You know, for a minister's daughter, you know a lot about life. Where did you learn it? In the choir loft. <laughs> I'll have to explain it to you sometime, darling. Which reminds me, I better run over and tell Father not to wait up for me. I've never been able to rationalize it. What? My falling in love with a girl who lives in Brooklyn. Falling in love, or you're not stooping to the articulate, are you? <clears throat> the only way I can regain my self-respect is to find a way to keep you in New York. Did you say keep? No, no, I've come to the conclusion that you're holding out for legalities. I can afford to be a good girl for quite a few years yet. Huh. And I can't wait that long. Where could we get married in a hurry? Say, tonight. I'm afraid Father will insist on officiating. Yes, I bet your father could make even the marriage service sound pedestrian. Are you by any chance writing a review of it? <laughs> Sorry, dear. Occupational disease. I may give that play tonight good notice. Oh, darling, don't pretend you love me that much. Be sure to tell your father not to wait up tonight. I think perhaps tonight I'd better tell him to wait up. I'll telephone Winchell, tell him to publish the bands. Nevertheless. All right. Everything formal and legal, but no later than next month. <laughs> Darling, I'll talk it over with Father and set the date. No, we'll have to see what's in rehearsal. There'll be other first nights in October. Hello, Mortimer. Oh. How are you, Mr. President? Bully, thank you. Just bully. What news have you brought me? Just this, Mr. President. The country is squarely behind you. Yes, I know. Isn't it wonderful? Well, goodbye. Goodbye. Where are you off to, Teddy? Panama. Panama's the cellar. He digs locks for the canal down there. Oh, you're so sweet <laughs> of him. And he's very fond of you. Well, Teddy's always been my favorite brother. Favorite? Were there more of you? Oh, there's another brother, Jonathan. I've never heard of him. Your aunts never talk about him. We don't like to talk about Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan left Brooklyn very hurt early. <laughs> by request. Jonathan was the kind of boy who liked to cut worms in two with his teeth. What became of him? I, I don't know. He wanted to become a surgeon like grandfather, but he wouldn't go to medical school and his practice got him into trouble. 
Aren't you two going to be late for the theater? Uh, no, we're skipping dinner. Uh, we won't have to leave for a half hour. Well, then I'll leave you two alone together again. Oh, don't bother, darling. I'm going to run over and talk to Father. Before I go out with you, he likes to pray over me a little. I'll be right back. I'll talk to the cemetery. <laughs> if that prayer isn't too long, I'd have time to lead you beside distilled waters. Mortimer, <laughs> <laughs> that's the first time I ever heard you quote the Bible. <laughs> we knew Elaine was a good influence for you. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm going to marry her. What? Oh, darling, Martha, Martha, come right in here. I've got the most wonderful news for you. Mortimer and Elaine are going to be married. Oh, married? Oh, Mortimer! <laughs> we hoped it would happen just like this. Oh, Elaine is the happiest girl in the world. Well, happy? Just look at her jumping over those gravestones. <laughs> <laughs> Say, what's that? What's what there? Oh, uh, that statue there. That's a her and Denita Carnina. Oh, no, dear, that's Emma B. Stout ascending into heaven. Uh, no, no, on Mrs. Stout's left ear, that uh, red-crested swallow. I, I've only seen one of those before in my life. I don't know how you could be thinking about a bird now. What with the day and the engagement and everything. Well, it's a vanishing species. Thoreau was very fond of them. Oh, uh, by the way, I, I left a large envelope here last week. Uh, it was one of the chapters of my book on Thoreau. Have you seen it? Well, if you left it here, it must be here somewhere. When are you going to be married? What are your plans? There must be something where you can tell us about Elaine. Uh, about Elaine? Um, yes, uh, she thought it was brilliant. What was here? My chapter on Thoreau. Well, when Elaine gets back, I think we ought to have a little celebration. We must drink to your happiness. Martha, isn't there some of that Lady Baltimore cake left? Oh, yes. And I'll open a bottle of wine. Oh, and to think it happened in this room. Oh! Now, where should I put that? Well, with your fiancé sitting beside you tonight, I do hope the play be something that you can enjoy for once. It may be something romantic. What's the name of it? Murder Will Out. Oh, dear. Uh, when the curtain goes up, the first thing you'll see will be a dead body. send Teddy to that sanitarium Happy Dale? Oh, yes, dear. It's all arranged. And Dr. Harper was here today and brought the papers for Teddy to sign. Oh, here we are. Oh, he's got to sign them right away. Oh, well, that's what Dr. Harper thinks. Then there won't be any legal difficulties after we pass on. Uh, he's got to sign them right this minute. Uh, he's down in the cellar. Get him up here right away. Oh, there's no hurry. It's all that. No, when Teddy starts working on the canal, there's no getting his mind on anything else. Teddy's got to go to Happy Deal now, tonight. Oh, no, dear. That's not until we're gone. Uh, right away, I tell you. Right away. Uh, why can you say that, Mortimer? Why, as long as we live, we'll never be separated from Teddy. Darlings, I, I, I'm sorry, but I've got some shocking news for you. Now, we've got to all try to keep our heads. Now, uh, you know how we sort of humored Teddy because we thought he was harmless? Why, well, he is harmless. He was harmless. That's why he's got to go to Happy Deal. Why, why he has to be confined. Mortimer, why have you suddenly turned against Teddy, your own brother? You're going to find out about this sooner or later. I might as well tell you now. Uh, Teddy's killed a man. Nonsense, dear. There's a body in the window seat. Yes, dear, we know. <laughs> you know? Oh, yes, dear. But that had nothing to do with Teddy. Now, Mortimer, just forget about it. Forget you ever saw the gentleman. Forget? We never dreamed we'd peek. But who is he? His name is Hoskins. Adam Hoskins. That's really all I know about him. Except that he's a Methodist. 
<laughs> That's all you know about him? Well, what's he doing here? I, uh, what happened to him? He died. <laughs> Aunt Martha, men just don't get into window seats and die. No, he died first. <laughs> but how? Mortimer, don't be so inquisitive. The gentleman died because he drank some wine with poison in it. How did the poison get in the wine? Well, we put it in wine because it's less noticeable. In tea, it has a distinct odor. <laughs> you put it in the wine? Yes. And I put Mr. Hoskins in the window seat because Dr. Harper was coming. So you knew what you had done. And you put the body in the window seat because Dr. Harper was coming. Not tea. That wouldn't have been very nice. Now, Mortimer, you know the whole story. Just forget about it. I do think Martha and I have a right to our own little secrets. <laughs> and don't tell Elaine. Oh, Abby, while I was out, I dropped in on Mrs. Short. She's much better, but she wants us to take Junior to the movies again. Oh, you must do that tomorrow or next day. Well, all right, but this time we'll see what we want to see. Junior is not dragging me to another one of those scary pictures. <laughs> <laughs> oh, city desk? Look, Al, this is Mort. When I left the office, I told you where I was going, remember? Mm -hmm. well, where did I tell you? Yeah, huh? yeah. It took about 30 minutes to get to Brooklyn. Uh, what time do you have? That's right. Well, I must be here. <laughs> Aunt Abby, Aunt Martha, come in here. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do about what, dear? There's a body in there. Oh, yes, Mr. Hoskins. Oh, good heavens. I can't turn you over to the police. What am I going to do? Well, for one thing, dear, stop being so excited. I did. And for pity's sake, stop worrying. We told you to forget the whole thing. But, Mr. Hoskins! Hoskins, dear. Well, whatever his name is, you can't just leave him there. Oh, we don't intend to, dear. No. Teddy's down in the cellar now, digging the lock. You mean, you're going to bury him in the cellar? Yes, dear, that's what we said with the others. <laughs> no, no, you cannot bury Mr. Hoskins into others. <laughs> when you say others, you mean others more than one others? The other gentleman. Oh, yes, uh, let's see. This makes 11, isn't it, Abby? No, dear, this makes 12. Oh, I think you're wrong, Abby. It's only 11. No, dear, because I remember when Mr. Hoskins first came in, it occurred to me that he would make just an even dozen. <laughs> oh, but you shouldn't count the first Oh, I was counting the first one. So that makes it 12. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Oh, oh, Al, it's good to hear your voice. Well, anyway, oh. they're all down in the cellar. Shh! Uh, look, Al, uh, uh, no, I'm as sober as a lark. I called you because I was feeding a little parandillo. Parent? <laughs> Don't worry about it, Al. You wouldn't understand anyway. Look, I'm glad you called. Get a hold of George right away. He's got to cover the play tonight. Uh, no, Al, you're wrong. Uh, George will have to cover the play. I'll explain it to you tomorrow. <coughs> well, George has got to cover the play. This is my department. I'm in charge of it. You get a hold of George. <laughs> Now, where were we? Twelve! Oh, yes, I didn't think we should count the first one, and that makes twelve. <laughs> Aunt Martha. All right, now. <laughs> Who was the first one? Mr. Midgley. He was a Baptist. I still don't think we can take full credit for him, because... He just died! And Martha means without any help from us. You see, Mr. Midgley came here looking for a room. 
It was right after you moved to New York. And it didn't seem right for that lovely room to be going to waste when there were so many people who needed it. He was such a lonely old man. Oh, his kids and kin were dead. Left him forlorn and unhappy. We felt so sorry for him. When his heart attack came, he'd like a dead oh, right there, looking so peaceful. Remember, Martha? We made up our minds then and there if we can help other lonely old men to that same peace, we would. <laughs> so a man dropped dead right there. Oh, how awful for you. Oh, no, it was rather like old times. Your grandfather used to have a cadaver or two around the house. You see, Teddy had been digging in Panama, and he thought Mr. Migley was the yellow fever victim. <laughs> that man, he has to be buried immediately. So we all took him down to Panama and put him in a lock. Now, that's why we said there's no need to worry because we know he Exactly what must be done. So that's all this, how all this started, that man coming in here and dropping dead. Oh, of course we realized we couldn't depend on that happening again, so. You remember the guards of poison up in the grandfather's laboratory all these years? You know your Aunt Martha's knack for mixing things. You'd be <clears throat> not for piccolilly. Well, for a gallon of elderberry wine, I take one teaspoon of arsenic, Add a half a teaspoon of strychnine and just the pinch of cyanide. <laughs> Should have quite a kit. <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, one of our gentlemen found time to say, How delicious. <laughs> well, I must get things started in the kitchen. I wish you could stay for dinner. I'm trying out a new recipe. I couldn't eat a thing. I'll come in and help you, dear. Well, I feel so much better now. Oh, you have to wait for Elaine, don't you? How happy you must be. Well, dear, I'll leave you along with your thoughts.
Hello, city desk. Oh, that's the doorbell here, not the telephone. Man! Oh, you do. Come in. I understand you have a room to rent? Yes. Well, just step in. <laughs> Are you the lady of the house? Oh, yes, I'm Miss Brewster. And this is my sister, another Miss Brewster. My name is Gibbs. Oh, won't you sit down? I'm sorry, we're just setting the table for dinner. Hello, Al City Desk. Al City Desk! Oh. I'm sorry, wrong number. <laughs> May I please see the room? Oh, why don't you sit down and let's get acquainted? Won't do much good if I don't like the room. Is Brooklyn your home? I haven't got a home. Live in a hotel. Don't like it. Hello, city desk. What well, are your family Brooklyn people? I haven't got a family. Well, Martha, all alone in the world? Yep. Uh, oh. Hey. You've come to the right house. Do sit down. Uh, Al, uh, this is Mark. We got cut off. Look, I, I can't cover the play tonight. That's all there is to it. I just can't. What church do you go to? There's a nice Episcopal church practically next door. I'm Presbyterian. Used to be. Well, what's George doing in Bermuda? Well, of course I gave him permission to go to Bermuda. It's my department, isn't it? But, but there must be someone else around the office. Is there always this much noise? Oh, no, he doesn't live here. Uh, look, Al, there must be somebody. How about the office boy? You, you know, the, the bright one, the one we don't like? <laughs> well, well, look around. I, I'll hold on. I'd really like to see that room. Oh, it's upstairs. Uh, won't you have a glass of our wine before we start up? <laughs> Never touch it. <clears throat> we make it ourselves. It's elderberry wine. Mm. Elderberry wine? I haven't had any of that since I was a boy. Well, well, George, there must be some, uh, Al, there must be some printers around. Uh, oh, uh, how about the man that sets my copy? He ought to know what I'd write about. His name is Joe. He's the third machine from the left. But oh, oh, you, watch out, he might turn out to be another Burns Mantle. Do you have your own elderberry bushes? Oh, no, but the cemetery is full of them. No, I'm not drinking. <laughs> but I'm going to start drinking now. Do you serve meals here? We might. Uh, but first, just see whether you like our wine. <laughs> Mortimer? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Mortimer, not that. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> what are you, crazy? You want to be, get out of here! You want to be poisoned? You want to be killed? Uh, you want to be murdered? Now you spoiled everything. You can't do things like that. I don't know how to explain this to you, but it's not only illegal, it's wrong. It's not a nice thing to do. People wouldn't understand. He wouldn't understand. Abby, we shouldn't have told Mortimer. What I'm trying to get at is, this has developed into a very bad habit. Mortimer, we don't try to stop you from doing things you like to do. <laughs> I don't think you should interfere with us. Hello? All right, Al. I'll watch the first act and pan it to pieces. But look, Al, you've got to do me a favor. Get a, head, a hold of O'Brien, our lawyer, the head of the legal department. Have them meet me at the theater. Okay, don't let me down. Okay, I, I'm on my way now. Look, I, I've got to go to the theater. I can't get out of this. But before I go, I want you to promise me this one little thing. Well, we'd have to know what it was first. I, I love you very much. And I know that you love me. And I would do anything in the world for you. So I want you to do just this one little thing for me. What do you want us to do? Don't do anything. I mean, don't do anything. Don't let anyone in this house and leave Mr. Hoskins right where he is. Why? I want time to think, and I've got quite a little to think about. You know, I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. Well, what on earth can happen to us? <sighs> you, you'll do this one little thing for me, won't you? Well, we were planning to hold services before dinner. Services? Certainly. You don't think we'd bury Mr. Hopkins without a full Methodist funeral, would you? <laughs> Why, he was a Methodist. But can't that wait until I get back? Oh, then you 
could join us. Yes, yes. <laughs> Mortimer, you enjoyed the services, especially the hymns. Remember how beautifully Mortimer used to sing in the choir before his voice changed? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, you'll do this one little thing for me, right? Well, oh, Martha, we can do that now that Mortimer's cooperating with us. Well, all right, Mortimer. Good. Okay. You won't let anyone in this house. That's a promise. Okay, good. Uh, I, I, do you have some paper? I've got to get going. There's a fellow I've, I've got to see. I, I can't get out of this. Oh, here's some stationery. Will this do? Oh, that, that's fine. I'll save time if I write my review on the way to the theater. <laughs> Abby Mortimer didn't sing quite himself today. Oh, that's only natural. I think I know why. Why? He's just become engaged to be married. I suppose that makes any man nervous. Oh, I'm so happy for Elaine. And their honeymoon ought to give Mortimer a real vacation. I don't think he rest much this summer. Well, at least he didn't go kicking off to China or Spain. Well, I never could understand why he wanted to go to those places. Well, I think to Mortimer the theater always seemed pretty small potatoes. He needs something big to criticize. Something like the human race. <laughs> oh, Abby, if Mortimer is coming for Mr. Hudson's funeral, we'll need another hymnal. There's one up in my room. Oh, you know, dear, it's really my turn to hold the services tonight. And since you weren't here when Mr. Hoskins came, I want you to do it. Oh, that's very nice of you, dear. But are you sure you want me to? It's only fair. <clears throat> well, then I think I'll wear my black limousine <clears throat> and mother's old broke. Did I hear a car pull up? Oh, Abby, we promised Mortimer not to let anybody in. Well, who do you suppose it is? I don't know. Oh, it's two men, and I've never seen them before. Are you sure? There's a car parked at the curb. They must have come out. Oh, do you recognize them? They're strangers to me. Then we'll just have to pretend we're not at home. Come in, Doctor. This is the home of my youth. As a boy, I couldn't wait to escape from this place. Now I'm happy to be escaping back into it. Yeah, Chawney, it's a fine hideout. Family still lives here. There's something unmistakably Brewster about the Brewsters. I hope the fatted calf awaits the return of the prodigal. Yeah, I'm hungry. Look, Chawney, drinks! As if we were expected. A good omen. Who are you? What do you want? And Abby, and Martha, it, it's Jonathan. You get out of here! But I'm Jonathan, your nephew, Jonathan. Oh, no, you're not. You're nothing like Jonathan, and don't pretend you are. You just get out of here. But I am Jonathan, and this is Dr. Einstein. Uh, he's not Dr. Einstein either. I'm not Dr. Albert Einstein, Dr. <laughs> Herman Einstein. <laughs> Who are you? You're not our nephew, Jonathan. Aunt Abby, I see you're wearing that lovely garnet ring that Grandma Brewster bought in England. And Aunt Martha, you're still hiding that scar where Grandfather's acid burned you. His voice is like Jonathan's. Have you been in an accident? No, my face. Dr. Einstein is responsible for that. He's a plastic surgeon. He changes people's faces. But I've seen that face before. Oh, Abby, remember when we took Junior to the movies and I was so frightened? It was that face. Oh, uh, easy, Choney, easy. Don't worry, ladies. In the last five years, I give Choney three new faces. I give him another one, too. I saw that picture just before I operated, and I was intoxicated. You see, doctor? <laughs> you see what you've done to me, even my own family. Choney, you're home now in this lovely house. How often he tells me about Brooklyn, about this house, about the aunts he loves so much. They know you, Chorney. Tell Jonathan you know him. Speak to him. Tell him so. Well, Jonathan, it's been a long time. 
What have you been doing all these years? Well, yeah, Jonathan, where have you been? No, oh, England, South Africa, Australia. The last five years in Chicago, Dr. Einstein and I were in business there together. We were in Chicago for the World's Fair. Yes, we, we found Chicago awfully warm. Yeah, it got hot there for us, too. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to be in Brooklyn again, though. And Abby, Martha, you don't look a day older. You're just as I remember you. Sweet, charming, hospitable. And dear Teddy, did he ever get into politics? My little brother, Doctor, he was determined to become president. Oh, Teddy's doing fine, just fine. And Mortimer as well, too. Yeah, I know about Mortimer. I've seen his picture at the head of his column. He's evidently fulfilled all the promise of his early nasty nature. We're very fond of Mortimer. Well, Jonathan, it was nice to have seen you again. <laughs> Bless you, Aunt Martha. It's good to be home again. Well, Martha, we mustn't let what's on the stove boil over. <laughs> Yes, if you'll excuse us a minute, Jonathan. Unless you're in a hurry to go somewhere. Well, where do we go from here? We gotta think quick. The police, the police have a picture of their face already. We gotta operate on you right away. We gotta find a place to do that. And we gotta find a place for Mr. Spinalzo, too. You don't wanna waste any worry on that rat. Johnny, we got a hot stiff on our hands. Forget Mr. Spinalzo. No, you can't keep a body in a rumble seat. <laughs> Oh, why'd you have to kill him, Chuny? He was a nice fella. He gives us a lift, and what happens? He said I look like Boris Karloff. <laughs> That's your work, Doctor. You did this to me. We find a place somewhere. I fix you up right away. You'd better. Uh, but I can eat first. I'm hungry. I, I'm weak. Jonathan, we're glad you remembered us and took the trouble to come in to say hello. But you were never happy in this house. And we were never happy while you were in it. <laughs> <laughs> so we just come in to say goodbye. Aunt Abby, I, I do understand your, your feelings toward me. I, I spent a great many hours regretting the many heartaches I must have caused you as a boy. You were quite a trial to us, Jonathan. But um, my greatest regret is for Dr. Einstein. I promised him that no matter how we rushed we were in coming through Brooklyn, I would bring him here for one of Aunt Martha's home-cooked meals. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm afraid there wouldn't be enough. Oh, Abby, it's a pretty good size pot roast. Pot roast? Well, I think the least but Bless you, Aunt Martha. We'll stay for dinner. <laughs> well, hurry along. Yes. Jonathan, if you want to freshen up, why don't you use the washroom in Grandfather's old laboratory? Is that still there? Oh, yes. Just as he left it. Well, I'll have Martha get things started, since we're all in a hurry. Well, we get a meal anyway. Grandfather's laboratory. I mean, just as he left it. Doctor, a perfect operating room. Too bad we can't use it. Oh, when you're done with me, we can make a fortune here. Why? Right. That laboratory, the large ward in the attic, ten beds, Doctor, in Brooklyn is crying for your talent. All right, work yourself up, Johnny. For Brooklyn, we're a year too late. <coughs> oh, you don't know this town, Doctor. Practically everybody in Brooklyn needs a new face. Yeah, but most of those faces are locked up. A small percentage. The boys in Brooklyn are famous for paying generously to stay out of jail. Well, take it easy, Chorney. You're honest, they don't want us here. We're here for dinner, aren't we? Yeah, but after dinner? Oh, leave it to me, Doctor. I'll handle everything. Why, this house will be our headquarters for years. Oh, that would be beautiful. This nice, quiet house. Your aunts, they're such sweet ladies. I think I love them already. I go get the bags. Eh? Doctor, we must wait till we're invited. But you just said that. We'll be invited. What if they say no? Doctor, two helpless old women. <laughs> oh, it all comes true like a beautiful dream. I hope you're not dreaming. It's so peaceful. <laughs> Doctor, that's what makes this house so perfect for us. It's so peaceful. <laughs> George! <laughs> meeting Dr. Einstein in London, I must say, those five years in Chicago 
They were amongst the happiest and the busiest of my life. And from Chicago, we go to South Bend, in Indiana. I don't think they want to hear about our experiences in Indiana. <laughs> well, Jonathan, you've led a very interesting life, I'm sure. We really shouldn't have allowed you to talk so late. You remember I was in South Africa in the diamond business, and then, the, then Amsterdam, the diamond market. Well, I wanted to go back to South Africa, and Dr. Einstein made that possible for me. Yeah, and a good job. When they take off the bandages, he looks so different, the nurse had to introduce me. No! <laughs> I love that face, doctor. I took Harry a picture of it with me. There it is. This looks more the way you used to look. But still, I wouldn't know you. I think we go back to this phase, Doctor. Yeah, it's safe now. Hmm. Well, I know you two want to get to where you're going. My dear aunties, I am so full of that delicious dinner, I'm unable to move a muscle. Yeah, it's nice here. Well, after all, it's very late, and I'm sure you I have something to go. I found it. What did you find, Daddy? The story of my life, my biography. Here's the picture I was telling you about, General. Here we are, both of us. President Roosevelt and General Gothel's at Culebra Cut. That's me, General, and that's you. My, how I've changed. <laughs> well, you see, that picture hasn't been taken yet. We haven't even started work on Culebra Cut. We're still digging locks. And now, General, we will both go down to Panama and inspect the new lock. Uh, no, Teddy, not to Panama. We go some other time. Panama's a long way off. <laughs> Nonsense. It's just down in the cellar. The cellar? We let Teddy dig the Panama Canal in the cellar. <laughs> General Gotels, as President of the United States, Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, and the man who gave you this job, I demand that you accompany me on the inspection of this new lock. Teddy, isn't it time you went to bed? I beg your pardon? Who are you? I'm Woodrow Wilson. Go to bed. <laughs> no, you are not Wilson. But your face is familiar to me. You're not anyone I know now. Perhaps later. <laughs> On my hunting trip to Africa. Yes! You look like someone I might meet in the jungle. It's your brother Jonathan, dear. He's had a taste change. So that's it. A nature faker. And perhaps you had better. Perhaps you had better go to bed, Teddy. Jonathan and his friend have to go back to their hotel. And Dr. G uh, General Gogles, uh, Inspector Ho the Canal. Okay, Mr. President, we go to Panama. Boy, boy, follow me, General. <laughs> oh, it's down south, you know. Well... Bon voyage! <laughs> and Abby, I must correct a misapprehension of yours. You spoke of a hotel. We have no hotel. We came directly here. Well, that's a nice little hotel about three blocks down the road. And Martha, this is my home. Oh, but Jonathan, you can't stay here. We need our rooms. You need them? Yes. For what? For our lodgers. You have lodgers? Here? Well, not right now, but we plan to have some. Oh, then my room is still free. Well, Jonathan, there's no place for Dr. Einstein. You can stay in the room with me. Well, Jonathan, I'm sorry. I'm you, afraid you can't stay here. Dr. Einstein and I need a place to sleep. Now, you remember this afternoon, as a boy, I could be very disagreeable. Ooh. Well, it wouldn't be very pleasant for any of us if this... Well, perhaps we ought to let them stay here tonight. Oh, for tonight, Jonathan. Good. Then it's seven. Please get my room ready. Well, it only needs airing out. We keep it ready to show our lodgers. I think you and Mr. Einstein will find it comfortable. You have a very distinguished guest in Dr. Einstein. But I'm afraid you don't appreciate his skill. You will, though. In a few weeks, you're going to see a very different-looking Jonathan. Oh, he can operate on you here. Uh, when Dr. Einstein and I get organized, when we resume our practice, Oh, I forgot to tell you, we're turning Grandfather's laboratory into an operating room. We expect to be very busy. Jonathan, we will not let you turn this house into a hospital. <laughs> a hospital? Oh, no. It will be a beauty parlor. 
<laughs> Johnny, down in the cellar. Doctor, my dear aunts have invited us to live with them. Ah, oh, you fixed it. Uh, you're sleeping here tonight. Please get our, our room ready immediately. Well, for tonight. Joey, down in the cellar, what do you think I find? What? The Panama Canal. Ah, the Panama Canal. No, it fit Mr. Spinazzo just right. It's a whole teddy dug it. It's six feet long and four feet wide. <laughs> <laughs> down there? Yeah, you'd think they knew we were bringing Mr. Spinazzo along. That's hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> Rather a good joke on the ants. They're living upstairs with a body buried in the, in the cellar. <laughs> How do we get them in? You're right, we can't walk them through the door. Well, we can bring the car up between the house and the cemetery. Then when everybody's gone to bed, we'll bring Mr. Spinozzo in through the window. Bed? Oh, just think we got a bed tonight. Easy, doctor. Remember, you're operating on me, and this time you'd better be sober. Oh, I fix you up beautiful. And if you don't... Jonathan, your room is ready. Well, then you two can go on up to bed. We're moving the car in off the street. Oh, the car's all right where it is until morning. We don't want to leave it in the street. It might be against the law. <laughs> Abby, what are we going to do? Well, we're not going to let them stay more than one night in this house for one thing. What would the neighbors think? People coming in here with one face and going out with another. <laughs> what are we going to do about Mr. Hoskins? Oh, Mr. Hoskins. It can't be very comfortable for him in there. He's <laughs> been so patient, the poor dear. Well, I think Teddy had better get Mr. Hoskins downstairs right away. Abby, I will not invite Jonathan to the services. Oh, no. We'll wait till they've gone to bed and then come down and hold services. General Gothels was very pleased. He says the canal is just the right size. Teddy, Teddy, there's been another yellow fever victim. Dear me. <laughs> this will be a great shock to the general. Well, then we mustn't tell him, dear. But it's his department. No, we mustn't tell him. It would just spoil his visit. I'm very sorry, Aunt Abby. It's out of my hands. You'll have to be told. Army regulations, you know. No, Teddy, you must keep it a secret. Yes. A state secret? Yes, a state secret. Promise? <laughs> you have the word of the President of the United States. Cross my heart and hope to die. Now, let me see. How are we going to keep it a secret? Well, Teddy, you go back down in the cellar, and when I turn out the lights, when it's all dark, you come up and take the poor man down to the canal. Go along, Daddy. And we'll come around later and hold the services. You may announce that the president will say a few words. <laughs> Where is the poor devil? What? He's in the window seat. It seems to be spreading. We've never had yellow fever there before. <laughs> <clears throat> Martha. When Jonathan and Dr. Einstein get back, let's see if we can get them to go to bed right away. And by the time they're asleep, we'll be dressed for the funeral. Oh, Abby, I haven't even seen Mr. Hodgkins. My goodness, that's right, you were out. Oh, well, you just come right over and see him now. He's really very nice looking, considering he's a Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're bringing the luggage in through here. Jonathan, your room's waiting for you. You can go right up. I'm afraid we don't keep Brooklyn hours. But you two can run along and go to bed. Oh, now you two must be very tired. And we don't go to bed this early. Well, you should. It's time I came home and took care of you. Well, we weren't planning to go to bed until much later. And Martha, did you hear me say run along to bed? Uh, the instruments can go to the laboratory in the morning, Doctor. Now, let's all go to bed. I'll wait till you're up and then turn out the lights. Next slide up, Doctor. Aunt Martha, run along. All right, Aunt Abby. I'll be right up. Now, Aunt Abby, turn out the light.
Hi, Johnny. I'll open the window. You go outside and hand him through. No, he's too heavy for me. You go outside and push, and I'll stay here and pull together. We get him to Panama. All right, I'll take a look around outside the house. When I tap on the window, you open it, all right? Yeah. All right. Ah! Who left this open, doom cough? Ah. All right, Johnny. Alley-oop. Wait, wait a minute. You lost a leg somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Ah! That was me, Johnny. I slipped. Be more careful. Well, his shoe came off. I got it. Oh, wait. Johnny. Johnny, somebody at the door. Go quick. No, I mean the kid. Go quick. Uh, Miss Abby? Miss Martha? Miss Abby? Miss Martha? Who is it? Is that you, Teddy? Who are you? Who are you? I'm Elaine Harper. I live next door. What are you doing here? I came to see Miss Abby and Miss Martha. Turn on the light, Doctor. You chose a rather odd moment for a social call. I think you'd better explain what you're doing here. We happen to live here. You don't live here. I'm in this house every day, and I've never seen you before. Where are Miss Abby and Miss Martha? What have you done to them? Now, perhaps we'd better introduce ourselves. This is Dr. Einstein. Dr. Einstein? Yes, a surgeon of great distinction. And something of a magician. And I guess you're going to tell me you're Boris Carl. I'm Jonathan Brewster. <laughs> oh, you're Jonathan. Oh, I see you heard of me. Yes, just today, for the first time. And what did they say about me? Only that there was another brother named Jonathan. That's all that was said. That explains everything. Now that I know why you're now that I know who you are, I'll be running along back home. If you will kindly unlock the door. That explains everything. What did you mean by that? Why do you come here at this hour of night? I thought I saw someone prowling around the house. I suppose it was you. You thought you saw someone prowling around the house. Yes, weren't you outside? Isn't that your car? You saw someone in the car. Yes. What else did you see? Just that, that's all. What else did you see? Just that. That's why I came over here. I wanted to tell Miss Abby to call the police. But if that was you and that's your car, I don't need to bother Miss Abby and I'll be running along home. What was the man doing at the car? I don't know. You see, I was on my way over here. I think you're lying. I didn't think she's telling the truth, Johnny. We let her go, huh? I think she's lying. Breaking into a house this hour of night. I think she's dangerous and shouldn't be let around loose. Take your hands off me! Doctor! It's going to be a private funeral. Teddy! Teddy, tell these men who I am! Oh, that's my daughter, Alice! No! Charles! Doctor, your handkerchief! Caught a burglar, a sneak thief. Now go back to your bedroom. We'll call the police. We've already called the police. We'll handle this. Go back to your room, you hear me? Mortimer! Mortimer, where have you been? To the Nora Bay's Theater, and I should have known better. Oh my. <coughs> I'm still there. <laughs> I know this isn't a nightmare, but uh, what is it? I've come back home, Mortimer. Who did you say this was? It's your brother Jonathan. He's had his face changed. And Dr. Einstein performed the operation. Jonathan. Jonathan, you always were a horror, but you had to look like one. Oh, easy, Johnny, easy. <laughs> Have you forgotten what I used to do to you when we were boys? You remember being tied to the bedpost? It is, Jonathan. Oh, yes, I remember you. I remember you as the cruelest, detestable, most vicious form of animal life I ever knew. Don't you two boys start quarreling again the minute you've seen each other. There won't be any fighting, Abby. Uh, Jonathan, you're not wanted here. Get out. <laughs> Dr. Einstein and I have, happen to have been invited. Not in this house. Um, just for tonight. But I don't want him anywhere near me. Well, we did invite them for tonight, and it wouldn't be very nice to go back on our word. All right, tonight. The first thing in the morning, out. 
Where are they sleeping? Oh, we put them in Jonathan's old room. That's my old room. I'm staying in that room. I'm here to stay. Oh, Wonder Man, I'm so glad. We sleep down here, Johnny. <laughs> you bet your life you sleep down here. You sleep on the sofa. I sleep on the window seat. The window seat? <laughs> Let's not argue about this. I mean, this window seat's good enough for me. I I'll sleep on the window seat. You know, Johnny, with all this argument, it makes me think about Mr. Spinazzo! <laughs> Spinazzo! Oh, why now, Mortimer? <laughs> it isn't necessary to inconvenience you like this. We'll sleep down here tonight. Jonathan, your sudden consideration for me is very lacking. I doubt it. Come along, Johnny. We get that things out of the room, huh? Uh, don't bother, Doctor. By the way, Doctor, I've completely lost track of Mr. Spinalzo. Who, who is this Mr. Spinalzo? Oh, just a friend of ours. Johnny's looking for him. Well, don't bring anyone else in here. Come on, Johnny. I'll explain it to you while we pack, huh? Uh, Mortimer, you won't have to sleep down here. I I can go in with Martha, and you can take my room. No trouble at all, Aunt Abby. We'll be packed in a few minutes, and you can have your room back, Mortimer. I've already told you you're wasting your time. I'm sleeping down here. Mortimer! What's the matter, dear? I've almost been killed. You've almost been... <laughs> Abby, Martha! <laughs> no, it was Jonathan! And he mistook her for a sneak thief. No, it was more than that. He's some kind of a maniac. Mortimer, I'm afraid of him. Oh, darling, you're trembling. Uh, do you have any smelling salts? No, but if you think some hot tea or coffee... Uh, coffee! You... And uh, make some for me, too. Oh, and some sandwiches. I haven't had any dinner. We'll make something for both of you. Martha, we can leave our things downstairs here now. Uh, are you going somewhere? You can't go. I mean, you know what time it is? It, it must be after a 12. 12? Uh, Elaine, you've got to go home. What? But you wanted some sandwiches for you both. It won't be a minute. Why, don't you remember we wanted to celebrate your engagement? Yeah. Yes, that's what we'll do. We'll make a nice supper for both of you, and we'll open a bottle of wine. Okay. <laughs> no wine! Mortimer, what is going on in this house? Well, what do you mean, what's going on in this house? You were supposed to take me to dinner at the theater tonight. You called it off. You asked me to marry you. I said I would, and five minutes later, you threw me out of the house. Tonight, just after your brother tries to strangle me, you want to chase me home. Now listen, Mr. Brewster. Before I go home, I want to know where I stand. Do you love me? I, I love you very much, Elaine. That's why I can't marry you. Have you suddenly gone crazy? I don't think so. But it's just a matter of time. <laughs> you see, insanity runs in my family. It, uh, practically gallops. <laughs> That's why I can't marry you, dear. Wait a minute. You're going to have to do better than that. Oh, no. Uh, there's a strange taint in the Brewster blood. If you really knew my family, it's, well, it, it's what you'd expect if Alfred Hitchcock wrote for the Marx Brothers. Just <laughs> because Teddy is a little bit. No, no. It, it goes way before that. The first Brewster, the one that came over on the Mayflower, you know how uh, Indians used to scalp the settlers? He used to scalp the Indians. Oh, Mortimer, that's ancient history. Uh, uh, take my grandfather. He used to try out his patent medicines on dead people to be sure he wouldn't kill them. But he wasn't so crazy. He made a million dollars. Uh, and then there's Jonathan. You just said he was a maniac. He tried to kill you. But he's your brother, not you. I'm in love with you. Well, and, and there's Teddy. You know Teddy. He thinks he's Roosevelt. Oh, no, dear. No Brewster should ever marry. I realize now that if I had met my father in time, I would have stopped him. <laughs> well, darling, all this doesn't prove you're crazy. Take your aunts, for example. They're Brewsters, aren't they? And the sanest, sweetest people I've ever known. Well, uh, even they have their peculiarities. <laughs> what lovely peculiarities. Kindness, <laughs> human sympathy. There's another one. Oh, Mortimer, there are lots of others. You can't tell me anything about your aunts. And I'm not 
I going to? Elaine, you, you've got to go home. Something's come up. Up from where? We're alone here together. Uh, I know I'm acting, acting irrationally. Uh, just put it the fact that I'm a mad Brewster. Now, if you think you're going to get out of this by pretending you're insane, you're crazy. <laughs> Maybe you're not going to marry me, but I'm going to marry you. I love you, you dope. Well, if you love me, you'll get out of here. Well, at least, at least take me home, won't you? I'm afraid. Afraid? A of a little walk through a cemetery? <laughs> Mortimer? Yes, dear. Won't you kiss me goodnight? Of course, dear. <laughs> uh, goodbye, Elaine. I'll call you up later. <laughs> you critic! <laughs> Three! <laughs> and Abby Aunt Martha, come in here. We'll be in in a minute, dear. Now come in here now. Where's Elaine? I thought you told me you weren't going to let anyone in this house while I was gone. Jonathan just walked I in. don't mean Jonathan. And Dr. Einstein was with him. I don't mean Dr. Einstein. Who is that in the window seat? We told you, Mr. Hoskins. It is not Mr. Hoskins. Who can that be? <laughs> Are you telling me you've never seen this man before? I certainly have. Why, this is a fine how do you do? <laughs> Getting so anybody thinks they could walk into this house. Oh, Aunt Abby, uh, don't try to get out of this. That's another one of your gentlemen. <clears throat> Mortimer, how could you say such a thing? That man's an imposter. <laughs> if he came here to be buried in our cellar, he's mistaken. <laughs> oh, Aunt Abby, you, you admitted me you put Mr. Hoskins in the window seat. I did. Well, this man couldn't have just gotten the idea from Mr. Hoskins. <laughs> but, by the way, where is Mr. Hoskins? He must have gone to Panama. <laughs> you buried him? No, not yet. He's just down there waiting for the services, poor dear. But we haven't had a minute while well, John is in the house. Dear, we always wanted to hold a double funeral, but I will not read services over a total stranger. Aunt Abby, how can I believe you? There are 12 men in your cellar, and you admitted to me that you poisoned them. Yes, I did. But you don't think I stooped at telling a fib. What's <laughs> up? like a word with you, Mortimer. A word's about all you have time for, Jonathan, because I've decided that you and your doctor friend have to get out of here as quickly as possible. I'm glad you recognize the fact that you and I cannot sleep under the same roof. But you've arrived at the wrong solution. Take your suitcase and get out. Jonathan, you're beginning to bore me. You played your one-night stand in Brooklyn. Now get out. My dear brother, just because you graduated from riding on the back fence to using a typewriter does not mean you've grown up. I'm staying, and you're going, and I mean now. If you think there's anything I can be frightened of, if there's anything I fear... I've lived a very strange life, Mortimer, and it's taught me one thing, to be afraid of nothing. Martha, just look and see what's in that window, see? And now, man. <laughs> <laughs> to see what's in the window seat. <laughs> and Abby, I owe you an apology. Uh, I uh, have some very good news for you. Jonathan is leaving. And he's taking Dr. Einstein and their cold companion along with him. <laughs> Jonathan, you're my brother. You're a Brewster. I'm going to give you a chance to get out of here and take the evidence with you. You can't ask for more than that. All right. In that case, I'll telephone the police. Don't reach for that telephone. Are you still giving me orders after seeing what happened to Mr. Spinalzo? Spinalzo? I knew he was a foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, what happened to Spinalzo can happen to you. Oh, hello, Miss Brewster. Officer O'Hara, is there something we can do for you? I saw the lights on. I thought there might be sickness in the house. 
I see you got some company. I'm sorry I disturbed you. Oh, no, no, no. Come on in. Yes, come in. Come right in, off the O'Hara. This is our nephew, Mortimer. Oh, pleased to meet you. And this is another nephew, Jonathan. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. <laughs> Must be nice having your nephews visiting with you. Are they going to stay a bit? <laughs> I'm staying. My brother Jonathan was just leaving. Uh, say, have I met you here before? Oh, I'm afraid not. Jonathan hasn't been home for years. Your face looks familiar to me. Maybe I see pictures of you somewhere. No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> yes, Jonathan, I'd hurry if I were you. Your things are all packed anyway, aren't they? Well, you'll be wanting to say your goodbyes. I'll be running along now. No, 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 no. What's the rush? I'd like for you to stick around until my brother leaves. I just dropped in to make sure everything was all right. Well, well, we were just about to have some coffee. Won't you join us? Oh, I forgot the coffee. Oh, and I'd better make more sandwiches. I ought to know your appetite by this time, Officer oh, O'Hara. Don't bother. I I'm due to ring in in a few minutes. Oh, well, you can stick around for a cup of coffee. Uh, stick around. My brother will be leaving soon. Uh, have a seat. Say, uh, have I seen a photograph of your brother around here somewhere? Uh, I don't think so. It sure reminds me of somebody. Mm, probably someone you've seen in the movies. Nah, I never go to the movies. I hate them. My mother says they're bastard art. It's full of them. <laughs> Your mother says that? Yeah, she was an actress. A stage actress. Maybe you heard of her. Peaches Latour? <laughs> well, sounds like a name I've read in a program. What did she play? Well, her big hit was Mutton Jeff. Played it for three years. I was born on tour in the third season. <laughs> you were? Yeah, Sioux City, Iowa. I was born in the dressing room at the end of the second act, and mother made the finale. <laughs> what a trooper. <laughs> yeah, there must be a great story in your mother. You know, by the way, I write about the theater. You do? Say, you're not more of a Brewster the drama critic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why, well, am I glad to meet you. You know, Mr. Brewster, you and I, we got that we're in the same line of business. We are? Yeah, I'm a playwright. Oh, this being on the police force, that's just temporary. Uh, uh, how long have you been on the force? Twelve years. I, I've been collecting material for a play. Oh, I bet it's a honey. Well, it ought to be. All the drama I see being a cop. Mr. Brewster, you got no idea what goes on here in Brooklyn. Oh, I think I have. <laughs> Uh, ten after one. Gee, I gotta ring in. No, no, no. Uh, stick around over here. You know, um, about that play of yours, uh, I think I might be able to help you. You would? <laughs> Say, it was fate me walking in here tonight. I I'll tell you the plot. <clears throat> oh, good. You're going, huh? <laughs> it won't be take you much long. <laughs> well, everything's just about ready. Oh, you leaving, Jonathan? Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dr. Einstein. Oh, doesn't this case belong to you? Yes, Jonathan. You can't leave without taking all of your things. Uh, look, O'Hara, uh, it was good talking to you. You were run along. We'll talk about your play later. No, oh, I'm not leaving now. Yeah, why not? Well, you just offered to help me with my play. You and me are going to write my play together. Oh, I, I can't do that, O'Hara. I'm not a creative writer. <clears throat> I'll do the creating. You just put the words to it. <laughs> but O'Hara. <laughs> oh, no. I ain't leaving this house till I tell you to plot. In that case, Mortimer, we'll be running along. Oh, don't you try that. You can't go yet. You have to take everything with you. Uh, look, O'Hara, you run along. My brother's just leaving. I can wait. I've been waiting 12 years. Oh, I'm sorry I was so long. Oh, no, no, don't bring that in here. Uh, O'Hara, won't you join us for a bite in the kitchen? The kitchen? Jonathan's leaving. Why, that's nice. Come along, Officer O'Hara. Sure you don't mind eating in the kitchen, Mr. O'Hara? Where else would you eat? <laughs> Goodbye, Jonathan. Nice to have seen you again. Happy. I'm glad you came back to Brooklyn, Jonathan, because it gives me a chance to throw you out. And the first one out is your boyfriend, Mr. Spinozzo. Hey, look, Mr. Bruce. We can talk in here. They're coming right in. <laughs> I'd have known you'd grow up to write a play with a policeman. Get going, all three of you. <laughs> Dr. 
Doctor, this affair with my brother has got to be settled. Oh, Johnny, we got enough trouble. Your brother gives us a chance to get away. What more can you ask for? You don't understand. This goes back a great many years. Oh, Johnny, let's get going. We're not going. We're sleeping right here. With a cop in the kitchen and Mr. Spinazzo in the window seat? That's all he's got on us. We'll take Mr. Spinazzo down and dump him in the bay. Then we'll come right back here. And if he tries to interfere... No, Johnny. Doctor, you know what I've made up my mind. Yeah, when you make up your mind, you lose your head. Brooklyn ain't good for you. <laughs> Doctor. Okay, okay, we stick together. But someday we get stuck together. But if we got to come back here, do we have to take these with us? No, leave those. Take this. Hide it in the cellar. Move fast. Spinals are going to go out the same way he came in. Hey, Johnny, come quick. What? You know the hole we got in the cellar? Yeah. We got an ace in the hole. I'll show you. <laughs> serious? You want me to tell O'Hara about what's in the window seat? We're staying right here. All right. This gets rid of you and O'Hara at the same time. Oh, Officer O'Hara, will you come in here, please? You tell O'Hara what's in the window seat, I'll tell him what's down in the cellar. The cellar? There happens to be an elderly gentleman down there who seems to be rather dead. <laughs> what were you doing in the cellar? What is he doing in the cellar? <laughs> no thanks, man. I've had plenty. They were Good. Now what are you going to tell O'Hara? Hey, look, Mr. Brewster, your aunt's want to hear it, too. Shall I get him in here? Oh, uh, no, no, not now, how, now, O'Hara. You've got to go ring in. Oh, the heck with ringing in. Let me get your aunt in here. I'll tell you the plot. No, not in front of all these people. Uh, tell you what, you run along and we'll get together someplace later. Hey, hey how, about, how about the back room at Kelly's? Fine, fine. You go ring in and I'll meet you at Kelly's. Why'd you two go get together down in the cellar? Yeah, that's all right with me. Uh, where's the cell? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, you go ring in and I'll beat you at Kelly's. All right. That, that'll just take me a minute. I'll ditch this guy and be back in five minutes. I expect you to be gone. Wait for me. <laughs> oh, we'll wait for him, doctor. I've waited a great many years for an opportunity like this. We got him right where we want him. Boy, did he look guilty. Take the bags back up to the bedroom, doctor. Are they gone yet? Oh, we thought we heard somebody leave. That was Jonathan. He'll be back in a few minutes. If there any food left in the kitchen, I think Dr. Einstein and I would enjoy a bite. But you won't have time. No, if you're still here when Mortimer gets back, he won't like it. Oh, he'll like it. to like it. So if there's any more food, please get it for us while we bury Mr. Spinalzo in the cellar. Oh, no! He can't stay in our cellar. No, Jonathan, you've got to take him with you. There's a friend of Mortimer's waiting down there for him. A friend of Mortimer's? Yes, and he and Mr. Spinalzo will get along fine together. They're both dead. Oh, he must mean Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins? You know what's in the cellar? Well, of course we do. He's no friend of Mortimer's. He's one of our gentlemen. Your gentlemen? And we won't have a stranger buried in our cellar. But, but, Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins isn't a stranger. Besides, there's no room for Mr. Spinazzo. Cellar's crowded already. Crowded? With what? There are 12 graves down there. <laughs> 12 graves? <laughs> that means very little room, and we're going to need it. You mean you and Aunt Martha have murdered? Murdered, certainly not. It's one of our charities. Why, what we've been doing is a mercy. You just take your Mr. Spinazzo out of here. You mean you two have done that? Here, in this house, buried them down there. Just think, Johnny, we've been chased all over the world. They stay right here in Brooklyn and do just as good as you. <laughs> I got 13. No, Johnny, you got 12. I got 13. Spinalzo. 
That first one in London, two in Johannesburg, one in Sydney, one in Melbourne, two in San Francisco, one in Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, the filling station. Three in Chicago, and one in South Bend. That makes 13. No, Johnny, the one in South Bend died of pneumonia. He don't count. He wouldn't have got pneumonia if I hadn't shot him. No, Johnny, he died of pneumonia. He don't count. He counts with me. I say 13. No. You get 12, and they get 12. Just think the old ladies are just as good as you. <laughs> they are, are they? Well, that's easily fixed. All I need is one more, that's all. Just one more. Well, here I am. Yes. Well, 
if Mortimer is really going to do something at last, that just means Jonathan's going to a lot of unnecessary trouble. We better tell. Oh, Jonathan, you might as well stop what you're doing. It's all done. Did I hear Mortimer? Well, it'll just have to be undone. We're all going to be out of this house by morning. Mortimer's promised. Oh, are we? Well, then, you and Aunt Martha can go on up to bed and have a pleasant night's sleep. Yes, come, Abby. Good night, Andy. Not good night, Jonathan. Goodbye. By the time we get up, you'll be out of this house. Mortimer's promised. And he has a way of doing it, too. Then Mortimer's here. Oh, yes. He's up here talking to Teddy. Well, good, good night, Andy's. Goodbye, Jonathan. Goodbye, Jonathan. Well, perhaps you'd better say goodbye to Mortimer, too. Oh, he'll see Mortimer. Yes, <laughs> I'll see Mortimer. Phew, that's all fixed up. Smooth like a lake. Nobody ever knew we were down there. Oh, I can feel that bed already. 48 hours we didn't sleep. Come on, Johnny, let's go up. Yes, you're forgetting, doctor. Uh, my brother. <laughs> Mortimer! Oh, not tonight. We do that tomorrow or the next day. <laughs> no, Doctor! Tonight! No. Now! No, Chinese. I'm tired. Tomorrow I gotta operate. Yes, Doctor. Tomorrow you're operating, but tonight we take care of Mortimer. Please, Chinese, we go to bed, huh? <clears throat> Look at me, Doctor. You can see it's gonna be done, can't you? Oh, I can see. I know that look. A little late to be dissolving our partnership now. Okay, but we do it the quick way, like in London with the quick twist. <laughs> No, I, I don't think so. I think this calls for something special. I think the Melbourne method. <laughs> oh, no, not that. And when that was over, what? The fellow in London was just as dead as the one in Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> it was over too quickly in London. There was no aesthetic satisfaction in it. But Melbourne, that was something to remember. Oh, I remember, I wish I didn't. No, not Melbourne, not me. Doctor, where are your instruments? No, I won't do it, Johnny, I won't do it. Doctor, go get your instruments. No, Johnny. Where are they? Oh, that's right, they're in the cellar. Where, where? I won't tell you. Never mind, I'll find them myself. Don't do that, Mr. President. <laughs> but I cannot sign any proclamation without consulting my cabinet. Huh, but this must be a secret. A secret? Proclamation? How unusual. Japan mustn't know until it's signed. Japan! Those devils! I'll sign at once! You have my word for it! I'll consult the cabinet later! No. Yes, let's go inside. You wait here! A secret proclamation must be signed in secret! But at once, Mr. President! I'll have to put on my signing clothes! <laughs> you go, yes! <laughs> Uh, no, Doctor, I'm waiting for something, something important. Oh, please, you go now. Look, Doctor, I I've got nothing against you personally. You seem like a nice enough fellow. But uh, take my advice, get out of here and get as far away as possible. Trouble yet, yeah, you get out. All right, don't say I didn't warn you. No, I'm warning you, go away quick. Oh, things are going to start popping around here any minute. Yeah, Johnny's in a bad mood, and when he's like that, he's a madman. Things happen, terrible things. Oh, Jonathan doesn't worry me now. Ah, Hamill, don't those plays you see teach you anything? About what? Well, at least the people in the play act like they got some sense. It's more than I can say for you. Oh, you, you think so, do you? you? You think people in plays act intelligently? I, I wish you had to sit through some of the plays I've had to sit through. Oh, uh, take this little opus I saw tonight. In this play, there's this fellow. He's supposed to be bright. He knows he's in a house full of murderers. He ought to know he's in danger. He's even been warned to get out of the house. But does he go? No. Now I ask you, doctor, is that something an intelligent person would do? You're asking me? <laughs> he didn't even have enough sense to be frightened, to, to be on guard. For example, uh, the murderer invites him to sit down. You mean, won't you sit down? <laughs> Believe it or not, that was in there too. And what did he do? He sat down. <laughs> there he, <laughs> mind you, here's this fellow who's supposed to be bright. So there he sits, just waiting to get trussed up. And what do they tie him up with? What? The curtain cord. Well, why not? A good idea, very convenient. A little too convenient. I mean, when a playwright's going to use some imagination, 
the curtain cord. He didn't see him get it? See him? He sat right there, the big dope. And now they say the critics are killing the theater. Oh no, it's the playwrights who are killing the theater. <laughs> so there he sits, this big dope, a fellow who's supposed to be right, right, just waiting to get trussed up and gagged. <laughs> <laughs> Achievement. After all, we're performing before a very distinguished critic. Now, Johnny. Doctor. Okay, but let's get it over. Doctor, get a hold of yourself. No, I gotta have a drink first. I can't do this without a drink. <laughs> Remember, we come here this afternoon, they had some wine. Oh, here it is. Look, that's all there is. But I split it with you, okay? We both need a drink. <laughs> Where are your manners? Yes, Mortimer. I realized it was you who brought me to Brooklyn. To my dear, dead brother. <laughs> he goes next, that's all. He goes next. No, not Teddy. That's where I stop. Not Teddy. We'll get to Teddy later. No, we don't get to him at all. Now we gotta move fast. Okay, but the quick way. Yes, Doctor, the quick way. <laughs> Hey, the colonel's got to quit blowing that horn. I will take the bugle away from him, officer. It's all under control. There's going to be devil to pay in the morning. Then we promised the neighbors he wouldn't do that anymore. It'll never happen again. Good night, officer. I better speak to him myself. Where are the lights? You. You stood me up. I waited an hour for you and Kelly. Oh, he was telling us about the play he saw, and that's what happened to him. <laughs> that was in the play you saw tonight? Well, they practically stole that from the second act of my play. Like, in the second act of my play, right before we... Wait a minute. I better begin at the beginning. It opens in my mother's dressing room, where I was born. Only I ain't born yet. <laughs> well, no. You're gonna listen to the plot. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, she's sitting at her table, putting on her makeup. When all of a sudden through the door comes this man with a black mustache. He walks up to her and he says, Miss Latour, will you marry me? <laughs> oh, oh, only he don't know she's pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> There she is, lying unconscious across the table in her lingerie. The killer is standing over her with a hatchet. I'm tied up in a chair like you are. The house is on fire. It's an inferno. When all of a sudden in through the window, 
comes Mayor LaGuardia. <laughs> Hey, remember who paid for that? Go easy on it. Well, I'm listening, ain't I? Well, how do you like it so far? Well, I'll put Johnny to sleep. Yeah, leave him alone. He got no more interest in that. He don't get a drink. So anyway, it's three days later. I've been transferred and I'm under charges on account of somebody stole my badge. So I'm walking to Beatles in Staten Island, 46th Precinct. When the guy I'm following, turns out he's really following me. Huh? Don't let anybody in. So I figure out how smart. There's a vacant house on the corner. I goes in. Cops! Huh? I'm standing there in the dark. I see the door handle turn. Cops! Johnny, cops! I pull my gun. I brace myself against the wall and I say, come in! Oh, what the hey. heck is going on here? What do you know, eh? Oh, but this is Mortimer Brewster. He's going to help me write my play. I was just telling him the story. Did you have to tie him up to make him listen? <laughs> Pat, you better report in at the station. The whole force is out looking for you. Did they send you here for me? I didn't know you was here. I came to warn the old ladies that there's going to be heck to pay. The colonel was out last night blowing the bugle. From the way the neighbors have been calling in, you would think the Germans had dropped a bomb on Flatbush Avenue. The lieutenant's on the war path. He says the colonel's got to be put away someplace. Yes, yes. Gee, Mr. Brewster, I got to get going. I'll just run through the third act real quick. Oh, get away from me. Say, do you know what time it is? It's after 8 o'clock in the morning. Oh, gee, Mr. Brewster, I, them first two acts run a little long, but... I don't see anything we can leave out. You can leave it all out. <laughs> Who the heck is this guy? That's my brother. Oh, the one that ran away? <clears throat> so he came back? Yes, he came back. This is Klein. Give me Mac. Pat, I better let them know we found you. Mac, tell the lieutenant he can call off the big manhunt. We got it. In the Brewster house. You want us to bring him in? Oh, all right, we'll hold him right here. The lieutenant's on his way over. So I've been turned in, eh? All right, you got me. I suppose you and that stool pigeon brother of mine are going to split the reward. Reward? <laughs> I do some turning in of my own. You think my aunt's a sweet, charming old lady, don't you? So there's 13 bodies buried in their cellar. Teddy! 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 What the heck are you talking about? Your aunts happen to be good friends of ours. I'll show you. I'll prove it to you. You go down the cellar with me. Hey, wait a minute. Thirteen bodies. I'll show you where they're buried. Oh, yeah. What, you don't want to go down the cellar with me? Go on down to the cellar with them, babe. I don't know if I want to be in the cellar with you. Look at you. Look at that puss. He looks like Boris Karloff. Get him off me! Get him off me! What are you guys doing here? I told you I would handle this. We were just about to. What happened? He put him in a fight? This isn't the guy that blows the bugle. This is his brother. He tried to kill me. All I said was he looked like Boris Karloff. Turn him over. Huh? We kind of think he's wanted somewhere. Oh, you kind of think he's wanted somewhere. If you guys don't read the circulars, we hang up in the station. The least you could do is read True Detective. Of course he's wanted in, in Indiana. He escaped from the prison with a criminally insane. He's a lifer. For Pete's sake, that's the way they described him. He looked like Karloff. Was there a reward mentioned? Yeah, and I'm claiming it. Well, he was going to put us down in the cellar. Down in the cellar? He Why? Said. He said there were 13 bodies buried down there. 13 bodies in the cellar? Oh. And that didn't tip you off he was out of a nut house. <laughs> well, I thought all along he talked kind of crazy. Oh, it's Shakespeare. Where <laughs> have you been all night? <laughs> Don't bother to tell me. I was right here, sir. I was, I was telling Mortimer Brewster he's going to help me write my play. Well, you're going to have plenty of time to write that play. We're finished here. You're suspended. 
Now, help Klein move this guy someplace else and bring him to. See what you can find out about his accomplice. Accomplice? Yeah, he's the guy that helped him escape. He's wanted too. Well, I tell you, no wonder Brooklyn's in the shape of said, but the police force full of flatheads like you falling for a story like that. Thirteen bodies in the cellar. But there are thirteen bodies in the cellar. Well, who are you? I'm President Roosevelt. <laughs> and what the heck is this? This is the fellow that blows the bugle. Good morning, Colonel. Oh, oh, Colonel, you've blown your last bugle. Dear me, another yellow fever victim. <laughs> All the bodies in the cellar are yellow fever victims. No, sir, Colonel. This is a spy we caught in the White House. Oh, will you get this guy out of here? If there's any questioning of spies to be done, that's my department. And you keep out of this. You're forgetting. As president, I am also head of the Secret Service. Captain, I'm Mortimer Brewster. Are you sure? <laughs> I'd like to talk to you about my brother Teddy, the one who blew the bugle. Uh, we've made well, a... Sorry, Mr. Brewster, but we're not talking about that. He's got to be put away. Oh, I quite agree with you. It's been all arranged for. I've got his uh, commitment papers here signed by Dr. Gilcrest, our family physician, and Teddy signed him himself, you see, and I've signed him as next of kin. Well, where's he going? Happy Dale. Well, that's all right. I, I don't care where he goes as long as he goes. Oh, <laughs> he's going all right. <laughs> but I want to make sure you realize that everything that's happened here... Teddy is responsible for. Now, as for those 13 bodies... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 13 bodies in the cellar. <laughs> it's bad enough that the neighbors are all afraid of him, and the bugle blowing disturbs the peace, but can you imagine what would happen if that cockeyed story about 13 bodies in the cellar got around? And now he's starting a yellow fever scare. <laughs> Cute, isn't it? <laughs> 13 bodies. You think there's any chance anyone would believe that? Well, you never know. Some people are just dumb enough. <laughs> you never know what people will fall, believe. And now, last year, there was this guy uh, that was crazy. He started a murder room over in Greenpoint, and I had to dig up a half acre lot just to prove that there were no bodies. If you'll excuse me. Good morning, Mortimer. Uh, good morning, dear. This is Mr. Witherspoon. He's come to meet Teddy. To meet Teddy? Mr. Witherspoon's the superintendent of Happydale. Oh, uh, and this is Captain... Uh, Lieutenant Rooney. I'm glad you're here, superintendent, because you're taking him back with you today. Today? Oh, well, not today. Uh, look, Elaine, I've got some business to attend to. Uh, you run along home. I'll call you up. Nuts! I had no idea it was this immediate. Well, the papers are all signed, and he's going today. Complete insubordination. You men will find out I'm no mollycoddle. When the President of the United States is treated like that, what's this country coming to? There's your man, Super. Hey, excuse me. Mr. President, I have some very good news for you. Your term of office is over. Is this March the 4th? Practically. Oh, well, let me see. Oh, now I go on my hunting trip to Africa. I must get started immediately. Is he trying to move into the White House before I've moved out? Who, Teddy? Taft! <laughs> <laughs> no, T Teddy, this isn't Mr. Taft. Uh, this is Mr. Witherspoon. He's to be your guide in Africa. Bully! 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 I would bring down my equipment when the safari comes. Tell him to wait. Goodbye, Aunt Demi! Goodbye, Aunt Martha! I'm on my way to Africa! Isn't it wonderful? Charge! <laughs> well, hello, Andes. Ooh, we have visitors! Well, this is Lieutenant Rooney. Oh, how do you do, Lieutenant? My, you don't look like the fuss budget the policemen say you are. <laughs> Why the Lieutenant is here, see, Teddy blew his bugle again last night. Yes, we're going to speak to Teddy about that. It's a little more serious than that, Miss Brewster. And uh, this is Mr. Witherspoon. Uh, he's the uh, superintendent of Happydale. 
Well, how do you do, Mr. Witherspoon? <laughs> You've come to meet Teddy. He's come to take him. Eddie's. I'm afraid the police want Teddy to go to Happydale today. Oh, no! Not while we're alive! Well, I'm afraid it's... I'm sorry, Miss Brewster, but it has to be done. The papers are all signed, and he's going along with the superintendent. We won't permit it. We'll promise to take the bugle away from him. We won't be separated from Teddy! I'm sorry, ladies, but the law's the law. He's committed himself, and he's going. Well... If he goes, we're going to. He'll just have to take us with him. Well, why not? We <laughs> <laughs> want to, but we can't take sane people in Happy Dale. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Witherspoon, if you let us live there with Teddy, we'll see that Happy Dale is in our will for a very generous amount. Well, Lord knows we could use the money, but. Oh, I'm well, let's be serious about this, ladies. For instance, here I am wasting my morning, and I've got serious work to do. Uh, you know, there are still murders to be solved in Brooklyn. Yes! Who uh, are they? <laughs> well, it's not just uh, the blowing of the bugle and the neighbors are afraid of him, but things could get worse. Uh, sooner or later, we'd be put to the trouble of digging up your cellar. Our cellar? Yes, your nephew's telling around that there are 13 bodies in your cellar. Uh, but there are 13 bodies in our cellar. <laughs> and if you think that's why Teddy has to go away, well, come down with us and we'll prove it to you. <laughs> There's one, Mr. Spinazzo, who doesn't belong here and who will have to leave. But the other 12 are our gentlemen. Oh, I don't think the lieutenant wants to look in the cellar. Why, he was telling me that just last year he had to dig up a half-acre lot. Oh, weren't you, lieutenant? That's right. Oh, you won't have to dig here. Graves are all marked. We put flowers on them every Sunday. Flowers? <laughs> the superintendent. Don't you think you could find room for these things? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Come along with us and we'll show you the graves. <laughs> Oh, I'll believe you, ladies. I'm a busy man. Well, how about it, Super? Well, they'll have to be committed. Well, Teddy committed himself. Can't they commit themselves? Can't they sign the papers? Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Oh, if we can live with Teddy, we'll sign the papers. Where are they? Yes, where are they? He's coming around, Lieutenant. Oh, good morning, Mr. O'Hara. Good morning, Mr. O'Hara. Are you here, too? <coughs> yes, ma'am. We, we got your other nephew back in the kitchen. Uh, Sign him up, Superintendent. I want this all cleaned up. Oh, 13 bodies. Can you sign right here, please? And you right here, Aunt Martha. I'm really looking forward to going. The neighborhood here has changed, so. <laughs> Just like a front lawn again. Oh, oh we're, we're forgetting something. What? Oh, we need the signature of a doctor. Oh. <laughs> Dr. Einstein, uh, would you come over here and sign some papers, please? Oh, please, I, I must. Oh, just this way, doctor. Oh, why, I thought the doctor was going to operate on me last night. <laughs> just this way, doctor. <laughs> sign right here, doctor. <laughs> were you leaving, doctor? Oh, uh, yes, I, I must be going. Are you going to wait for Compton? Oh, I don't think we're going to the same place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great, you're here. Good, good. Uh, stick around, eh? Don't worry, I intend to. Hello, Mike. Rooney. We picked up that guy that's wanted in Indiana. Oh, this is a description of his accomplice. It's lying there on the desk. Read it to me. Yeah. 54... Six foot two, 240 pounds. Blue eyes, German accent. Oh, Moses is a doctor. Thanks, Mac. Oh, it's all right, Lieutenant. The doctor here has just completed all the signatures. Oh, well, thanks, Doc. You're really doing Brooklyn a service. Oh, Mr. Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> I sign as next to Kim. Next to Kim, yeah. yes. There right. we go. Okay, so that makes everything all right? Everything legitimate? Oh, yes. I think so. Well, 
Well, Annie's, now you're safe. Oh, when would you be ready to start? Mr. Witherspoon, why don't you go upstairs and tell Teddy just what he can take along? Upstairs? Oh, I can show you. And now, Mortimer, you stay here. We want to talk to you. Yes, Mr. Witherspoon. Just upstairs and turn to the left. Mortimer, now that we're moving, this house really is yours. Yes, dear, we want you to live here now. Oh, oh no, Aunt Abby. <laughs> this house has too many memories. <laughs> oh, but you'll need a home when you're in Elena, Mary. <clears throat> Darlings, that's very indefinite. It's nothing of the kind. We're going to be married right away. Mortimer, Mortimer, we're really very worried about something. Now, darlings, you're going to love it at Happy Dale. Oh, we're very happy about the whole thing. That's just that we don't want anything to go wrong. Will they investigate those signatures? Oh, don't you worry. They're not going to look up Dr. Einstein. It's not his signature, dear. It's yours. You see, you signed his next of kin. Well, of course. Why not? Well, dear, it's something we never wanted to tell you, but now you're a man, and it's something Elaine should know, too. Oh, you see, dear, you're not really a Brewster. Your mother came to us as a cook, and you were born about three months afterward. And she was such a sweet woman and such a good cook. We don't want to lose her. So brother married her. I'm not really a Brewster? Oh dear, don't take it too badly. And Elaine, it won't make any difference to you. Elaine, did you hear? Do you understand? I'm a bastard! <laughs> Oh, and 
doesn't seem like held a very wine nowadays. I can't remember the I had my last glass of it. Here it is. <laughs>